Up Close is presented by Tenova Healthcare with six hospitals and more than 1,000 dedicated physicians. For more information, tenova.com. New surgical treatments are helping people get rid of the burn that for many follows every meal. The latest treatments and tools next on Up Close. Thanks for joining us for Up Close. I'm Stephanie Aldrich. This week we take a closer look at some cutting edge treatments to ease the burn so many people feel just from eating. Whether you call it heartburn, acid reflux, or GERD, many people suffer daily from that uncomfortable feeling. There are lots of things you can do on your own to try and ease the pain, like avoiding spicy foods or not lying down too soon after eating. And drugs can help for a while. But doctors say it just might not be enough if the discomfort continues for years. Dr. David Harrell says there's no need for patients to just suffer through it. He's seen treatments evolve greatly over the years. And today, he's treating patients with some help from cutting edge technology. We got an up close look at the robotic surgery that's making a difference in patients' day to day lives. Well, Dr. Harrell, a lot of people suffer with acid reflux. I wanted to ask you, what drew you to the specialty in the first place of helping people deal with this? Well, it's part of general surgery, and so I had exposure early on in training. And uh, in my residency in Louisville, Kentucky, we had a lot of experience with it. And uh, we used to do the operations for reflux and heartburn and hiatal hernias through an open large incision. And when I was in training, it was the revolutionary age of laparoscopic surgery. And so I, I got to be in the, in the lab experimenting with uh, the laparoscopic approach. So I learned how to do it in an animal lab. And all of my animals did well. Well, tell us a little bit more exactly what is acid reflux. I think a lot of people might just say heartburn, but are there, I'm sure there's different degrees of this, but just uh -huh. kind of a basic definition of what is it? Well, it's um, probably can be said, it can be called different names. And so some people call it acid or heartburn. Some people call it GERD, and that stands for gastrointestinal reflux disease. And then uh, some people call it uh, just heartburn, plain old heartburn. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference between those, or the degree of maybe the discomfort someone feels, or is it just kind of different names for the same thing, really? Pretty much the same thing. There are different types of reflux. You can get acid reflux, and you can get bile reflux, or so-called bland reflux. But uh, the bottom line is reflux involves fluid that's in the stomach that's supposed to stay there, and for whatever reason, it keeps coming up the swallowing tube or the esophagus and causing a lot of problems. That sounds like it could be very disruptive. Oh, it's horrible. You can't sleep and a lot of patients end up uh, sleeping in the recliner. And uh, in fact, a lot of times, uh, you know, the heartburn medicines are sometimes advertised in the wee hours, in the late night TV, because those are the times when, when the patients are really awake and, and thinking they need it. But Tums and Rolades and and Maalox, those kind of things help some, but they don't prevent it. It's more for a rescue mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're in that situation. I had just a touch of it one time in my life when I was pregnant, and I don't wish it on anybody, really. And that, yeah, I mean, I had no more room, you know, and it makes you mm -hmm. tired and all that, and it really does affect your life. Well, it can be um, disruptive, and some people have it even during the day. And, uh, you know, it's, it tends to be worse at night, but also when you bend over, a lot of it's gravity, and uh, so, you know, if there's pressure here, patients that are a little bit overweight, there's more pressure on their belly, and so the stomach takes less mm -hmm. nudging to get it, the fluid to go up instead of go down. Sure. And the bending, the tight clothes, and then, of course, the acid and the, um, the, the spicy foods and the alcohol make the, the little sphincter muscle kind of relax, so that makes it worse too. Sure. Just how common is this? Very common. It's probably um, something that everybody experiences, you know, occasionally, depending on what they eat and what they do. But then when it gets to be a daily or nightly thing, that's when it's severe. 
Is there a certain age group that we see this more common than in others, or does it just kind of run the gamut? It runs the gamut, and I think it's, you know, I always have patients that, that say they were refluxing even when they were teenagers. And so, um, you know, I, t I have one child who has always sort of had the, the tendency to belch a little bit more than the others, and those patients tend to, you know, they probably have a little bit of relaxation of their muscle here, which is like a valve, and uh, so things kind of tend to go up and down, not just go down. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of patients have had it through their whole life. You talked about some of the causes and certain food triggers. Is it, the, is, is it the same for everybody or do different people maybe feel it more, maybe is stress a trigger for it as well as, you know, alcohol or the spicy foods or, you know, is, does it, is there sometimes just a different combination that is okay for one person but is just really horrible for another person and what they're going to pay for it later, I guess, is a way I would say it. Yes. And I, mean, I think the symptoms run the, you know, the spectrum. And so some people have more reflux symptoms than others, and some people have more uh, burning and pain symptoms. We, we, there also are a lot of patients that have respiratory or upper, upper GI or respiratory symptoms with throat irritation. Sometimes the acid can actually come up into the throat and cause uh, hoarseness, bitter taste in the mouth, sore throats. Even some patients say their dentist uh, has can tell and that mm. it's starting to erode the teeth with the acid mm -hmm. and uh, some people they have the hoarseness and they get seen by their ear nose and throat doctor who said their vocal cords is scratched because of this and, and then some people have their pulmonary doctors advise them to get it fixed because of all the, the uh, asthma and, and pulmonary and, and pneumonia issues so it can affect a lot of things and uh, a lot of times it you know, with the, the stomach pills, there's not the acid, but they still have the, the bile and the uh, fluid coming up, which mm -hmm. causes lung problems. So it, it can run the, the whole spectrum of symptoms. Will lifestyle changes solve the problem? It, you know, if, even if someone's reluctant to even just start out on, on taking the drugs, will, the li will lifestyle changes with, you know, what you choose to eat, the time you choose to eat, or lay down, lie down after eating, will those things, just help a little or would, is it possible to solve the problem on your own? Well sometimes it is and certainly in the early phases and the, in the uh, initial phases when the symptoms aren't so bad the, there's easy things you can do to prevent problems and and the, probably the easiest thing to do is don't eat too soon before you go to bed and when you do go to bed raise the head of your bed uh, you know it's easy to put a, a wedge but it kind of bends you mm -hmm. at the waist. The, yeah. Probably the more sh surefire way to do it is actually get a block, mm -hmm. probably about four, four inches, even six inches if you can t take it and put it under the head of the bed so the whole bed is slanted. And that just lets gravity work in your favor. And those are the easiest things to do. And most people will kind of also experiment with what foods work better for them and what to avoid. If I am suffering from this and it's been some time and I've tried to lay off the spicy food and I've tried to make some adjustments and I'm just still not feeling real well and I feel like it's really affecting my sleep and my family because I'm then not at, at my best and everyone around me is now grumpy because I'm grumpy. You know, I'm sure you've seen these kind of things play out. What would you suggest I do? What kind of doctor should I first go and see now? It's probably best if you haven't been scoped to go see a gastroenterologist and get a scope because what you want to make sure about is that you're, you don't have some kind of uh, uh, cancer or polyp or stricture or sometimes the lining of the esophagus can get mm -hmm. irritated so much that it actually changes to a uh, kind of a stomach lining mm -hmm. and that's a precursor of cancer. So those things have to be monitored. Um, you know, more often than not it's just the reflux or it's just some irritation and uh, the medicines work, but if those things don't work, then you can always come see us and we can uh, fix it for you. At what point do you think people need to just make that call and, and call the doctor and stop trying, you know, at what point, of what kind of severity of symptoms should people just maybe try not to solve this on their own anymore? Is there, what kind of symptoms should really set off some alarm bells of, you know, this is maybe a little more serious and I need some help here? I think the 
the encouraging thing about all of this is that there is a, a solution. I mean, I mean, I think some people kind of go through years and years and even decades thinking I have to live with this and it's just kind of the way I am. But, you know, if you're done, I mean, I think <laughs> mostly I don't try to push anybody one way or the other, but usually they come to me mm -hmm. and they're done mm -hmm. and they're just tired of it. The medicines aren't working. They're not resting. You know, I guess it's basically when your symptoms aren't being controlled. And we call that, you know, medically unresponsive. And, and I guess that's a little different for each patient. But uh, the bottom line is when you come to that conclusion that, uh, you know, nothing else is working. But if you are, if you do start having this, is this something that ever just goes away on its own? Not really. I mean, if you really were to cut down some of your, uh, your bad uh, inciting factors, you know, mainly, you know, terribly obese patients will get a lot of relief if they can lose weight, but that's easier said than done. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, short of that, there's probably not a whole lot else you can do other than the things we talked about. I think you touched on this a little bit already, but uh, other more major problems happening as a result of maybe not addressing mm -hmm. this soon and esophageal cancer, that would, that would be a biggie that would, if I was suffering yes. through this for years, to want to be seen. It really Absolutely. does increase your chances for that. Yes, there's a process called Barrett's esophagus. Mm -hmm. And basically what that means, it's just a, a medical term but what it means is that the, the lining of the esophagus has gotten so irritated and burned and damaged through the years that it turns, it's like a scar that keeps getting opened and it finally just gets to be a, uh, it changes the lining and it turns it from a, an esophageal lining to a stomach lining. And that's a precursor for cancer. Or it just it's makes you more vulnerable. Risk, it makes you a high, at higher risk for cancer. And those patients have to be checked on it you know, every year or every other year basis. Usually the gastroenterologists do that, but they monitor for changes and for early warning signs of cancer. When someone comes to see you, um, are there certain tests that you, that you do initially to find out what course of treatment would, be wor uh, would work for different patients? Uh, what, what are some of the things that you do to assess a patient of where they are with suffering from GERD, acid reflux, whatever you want to call it uh, at the time? What are, what are some of the first things that you set out to do for them? We don't go straight from the office to the operating room. So mm -hmm. you're right, there is a process. And typically there's four main tests to check before we would recommend surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the scope is something we already talked about. Mm -hmm. I don't do the scopes personally, but you know I can direct you mm -hmm. to a doctor for that. And that just helps us to look at the lining and make sure that it's okay. Um, it gives us an idea of the anatomy. An x-ray can also do that same type of thing, and it gives a road map of what the esophagus and what the stomach look like. It gives an idea about the, the muscle function and whether there's a blockage. Mm -hmm. It tells a lot of information. So that's there's a good a, first step. That's your first real good right. look-see of what's going on. It's a great first step, and it, it doesn't, it's not painful. You have to drink I say, It doesn't sound dye. comfortable, but yeah. Well, there's no needles and there's no uh, pain involved. It's just you just drink some, some dye. It's a little chalky, but it doesn't have a bad taste. Okay. And, um, and then they take x-ray pictures as it goes down. And so they can tell a lot from that. The, the other two tests are a little bit more invasive, but still not, not terribly bad. One's a, you have to swallow a tube sometimes just to check the muscle function. It's a manometry or pressure mm -hmm. test okay. just to make sure your muscles are functioning right. Because if they're not, if they're in spasm or if they're too weak, then the, it affects what surgery you would be able to tolerate. Are there any other tests beyond that at that point? If it's still, if the diagnosis is still uncertain, mm -hmm. there's a, it's called a pH probe or a pH test. Mm -hmm. And um, typically it involves a scope also mm -hmm. where the, the GI doctor or the gastroenterologist will put a little uh, monitor on the inside of your esophagus and it actually records the acid levels coming up. And it's sort of the, the gold standard, you know, if there's a question about exactly what's going on it typically tells us more information than anything else. It's not always needed, and if, if I can prove it, 
uh, what you have. If the diagnosis is clear, then we won't do that. We talked a little bit about the medications and how they're a good first step, but you know, sometimes people have been taking them for years and years and then they've come to a point they just don't work well anymore. I want to talk to you in a minute about some more of the, the treatments and the newer treatments that you're involved with now, mm -hmm. but are there other risks that people need to consider with taking these medications also, other than the yes. fact that eventually they just might not work very well for you anymore? Yes, there is some uh, data and research coming out nowadays more and more that the uh, stomach pills have some adverse effects long term, uh, certainly no, uh, no short term effects like this, but over years and years and years it can affect your ability to absorb calcium mm. and so the bone density and osteoporosis mm. risk go up. Also there may be some stomach lining effects, you know, with the, the acid being reduced, the stomach lining uh, cells that try to secrete acid kind of mm -hmm. go crazy and sometimes little polyps and can be worse. Uh, those have to, you know, those sometimes can be affected by the, the long-term medicines and also colon infections too. So um, You don't want to trade one problem for another, right? <laughs> it can be a side effect, yes. But I think for most people that take it long-term, the most uh, the only, the real concern is, is the osteoporosis. That's mm -hmm. the major concern. Let's talk a little bit more about the surgical options. And you, again, you already mentioned that it, it's not just going from a meeting to, okay, right. let's go to the operating room, that there's a, a long process of tests to make sure this would be the right fit. But what are some of the newer surgical treatments available now for patients that, that you do for them and that you provide? Well, it's, um, there's, a, there's a new procedure that's called the TIF and it is a endoscopic procedure. And it basically is, does not require any, any surgery as far as a cut or a scar. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we go down with a scope and it's a special machine that can actually create a valve and it pinches the stomach and the esophagus together all the way around. And it basically creates a flap so that uh, kind of re, uh, strengthens the natural valve that you have between your stomach and your esophagus. Okay. It works pretty well. It keeps not, the acid down where it's supposed to be. It's supposed to create like a one-way valve. Uh -huh. And it does that fairly well. It, uh, the, the good part about it is that, of course, you don't have to be cut on. And uh, the bad part about it is that it's fairly new and it doesn't have quite the track record that the uh, surgical option has. So we can't really guarantee or, you know, give as much uh, uh, results, mm -hmm. you know, long-term results. And in fact, um, some of the insurance companies, in fact, most of the insurance companies are really hard on it because mm -hmm. it doesn't have that track record. And so a lot of times just patients just can't get it approved. Sure. We just need to see it's some not, more long-term successes first before we, it becomes more common, I would imagine. That's right. We are doing that for the select patients. You can't have a big hiatal hernia. Uh, it won't, you won't be a candidate. But um, because of the, of the payment options with the insurance companies, a lot of times it's just not an option okay. for uh, most patients. And so that's one of the newest things out right. there, still kind of being proven. But you do something else much more often here as well. Yes. In, here at uh, Tenova, we have a, the robotic, the, the uh, Da Vinci system. And so for the last two years, myself and my partners have been doing the robotic uh, Nissen fundoplication. And uh, basically it's the same operation that's been done for 40 or 50 years with, uh, with open surgery and with laparoscopic surgery, except we're using the robotic arms to do all the work inside. It's almost like I was a little leprechaun <laughs> getting to go inside there and work with little bitty hands and I can see really well uh, with the laparoscope, you only, can, you only have mono, uh, mono vision, okay. but with this you have binocular vision. And so I can see better, there's better depth perception, and the instruments have wrist. So it's, it's really almost like I was able to get in there and tie and sew, and it's kind of like a video game, but I'm, I'm right here, mm -hmm. and the patient's right here. So I'm in the same room, and uh, I'm doing all the motions myself, but the robotic arms are what's actually inside 
the patient. I think that's sometimes when people hear robotic surgery, I mean, you, you still have to be involved. There, yes. <laughs> You're at the controls. I'm doing everything uh, personally, but it's just the robot is, my, is a tool. And it makes it easier to work. At. And I, I'm able to do more complicated surgeries that used to be requ used to require open, even chest mm -hmm. operations. So it sort of in, enabled me to, to take it farther, and I feel like I'm able to get a better repair than I, I used to get to do. Even then, and you remember when it was exciting to have the laparoscopic method right. come, come on the scene, and now you've seen this evolved as, I guess, as an extension of that, things being able to provide a better treatment for your patients even with this, would you say that? I would say so. I mean, uh, it's really kind of the same surgery, but I feel like it's, it gives me an extra layer of security with the ability to put stitches where I couldn't put them before and to see better. And uh, if you ask me, would I ever go back to the old laparoscopic way? No way. Really? Because it's just so much better as far as uh, from my standpoint and from the ability to work and the, the, uh, the amount of confidence I have with my, my stitches, I, I just wouldn't go back. What is the recovery like between the two for, for the patient? I think it's similar. There's uh, tiny little holes either way, band-aids, band-aid cut, so to speak. And so typically they go home the next day. That's hard to imagine. And uh, usually the first, I try to make it a little bit tight on the first uh, outset because you know, sometimes the, the repair and the wrap will, will relax a little bit. So at first, you, you have to stay on uh, not baby foods, but just kind of soft foods like mashed potatoes or mm -hmm. soups mm -hmm. or smoothies or um, things that you can put in a blender. Right. And uh, typically for a couple of weeks, just to let the swelling go down and uh, just to try to make sure everything's okay. For your, with your swallowing before you start going out and eating. Well, that might uh, be a hard part of the recovery <laughs> for me. I don't know. That, but no, it, this, in all seriousness, if you have that small of an incision and you're right. physically able to get around better and um, a after having such a surgery, you know, certainly making some adjustments in, in the eating, which you've probably been doing anyway with your eating they for do. so long that it's really just another little adjustment for a, a short amount of time, right? That's what have true. your patients been saying to you about it after post-op? Well, it's been amazing, and I just had a patient Monday, in fact, that gave me a big hug because she was just for the first time in almost in 20 years that she'd been able to uh, walk around without this throat clearing mm -hmm. sensation and this mm -hmm. fullness in her throat and the acid, and uh, so it was really revolutionary for her, life-changing. And they, they almost always tell me that. It's just, I wish I'd done it sooner. What has it been like for you as a physician to see treatment for this evolve? You know, what some people might say, oh, it's just a tummy ache, you know, a little heartburn. But when you see lives really change for the better because of this and just the methods get better, even just during the duration of your career so far, uh, what does that mean to you to have been, you know, seeing it all play out in front of you and being able to actually use these tools yourself? What has that been like for you? Well, it's been fun. And and it, I think the best part for me is when the patients come back in the office and I see them two weeks later or six weeks later or two months later and they're just so happy. And that's, that's always fun. And just with minimal scars, they, they really appreciate that and minimal disruption to their life. And I think with the um, better techniques with the mesh we use to strengthen the, the uh, hiatal hernia, mm -hmm and the, uh, the ability to do it robotically, I feel like I'm getting them a better repair. And so, um, you know, another thing we do a lot of with the robot is uh, hiatal hernia repairs. Mm -hmm. And patients come in all the time with what they call high hernias. Right. And that's sort of What a, is it specifically? What is, I mean, technically, what, what is the hiatal hernia uh, issue, if you will? Well, it's, it's a hernia just like any, any place else. It's kind of a weakness in the, the muscle layer mm -hmm. between the stomach and the chest. Mm -hmm. And the stomach goes up into the chest. And basically with every breath, you're mm -hmm. kind of drawing it up. It's a suction. Yeah. It's not necessarily gravity, but it's suction. When you breathe in, you're, you're creating a vacuum. And so it pulls, pulls that stomach up. Pretty uncomfortable. 
And so it gets bigger and bigger with time. And that's one of the areas where the robot has been fabulous because I can get way up to the, the hernia and pull it down and then close the, the muscle and we put a patch on it to keep it stronger and, and make, make it stronger. And then we usually do the same wrap mm. that we do for people that have reflux. And, and a lot of times they're having reflux too, but they can't swallow and, and uh, have a lot of choking issues as well. It sounds like it's been rewarding for you to see the, the results and people on their feet and feeling better pretty quickly. Oh, I love it. Well, Dr. Harrell, thank you so much for spending time with us and talking about some of these newer techniques could, that could really help people deal with this and feel so much better. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I want to thank Dr. Harrell and his team for letting me try out the controls on the training system so I could get a little bit of a feel for what he was describing. Those robotic arms and tools really do act like an extension of your hands and I can see how in a set of skilled hands why it could be a valuable tool in the operating room. By the way, Dr. Harrell has been named a City View Top Doc for the last four years, an honor voted on by peers in the medical community. We hope you'll join us next week for another edition of Up Close. I'm Stephanie Aldrich. Up Close is presented by Tenova Healthcare with six hospitals and more than 1,000 dedicated physicians. For more information, tenova.com.